The Hiding Place, Chapter 4, Part 2. And so it was out. We had divided the work backwards. It was astonishing once we made the swap how well everything worked. The house had been clean under my care. Under Betsy's, it glowed. She saw beauty in wood, in pattern, in color, and helped us to see it too. The small food budget, which had barely survived my visits to the butcher and disappeared altogether at the bakery, stretched under Betsy's management to include all kinds of delicious things that had never been on our table before. Just wait till you see what's for dessert this noon, she'd tell us at the breakfast table. And all morning in the shop, the question would simmer in the back of our minds. The soup kettle and coffee pot in the back of the stove, which I never seemed to find time for, were simmering again the first week Betsy took over. And soon, a stream of postmen and police, derelict old men and shivering young errand boys were pausing inside our alley door to stamp their feet and cup their hands around hot mugs, just as they'd done when Mama was in charge. And meanwhile, in the shop, I was finding a joy in work that I'd never dreamed of. I soon knew what I wanted to do more than wait on customers and keep the accounts. I wanted to learn watch repair itself. Father eagerly took on the job of teaching me. I eventually learned the moving and stationary parts, the chemistry of oils and solutions, tools and grind wheel and magnifying techniques. But father's patient, his almost mystic rapport with the harmonies of watchwork, these were not things that could be taught. Wristwatches had become fashionable and I enrolled in a school which specialized in this kind of work. Three years after mama's death, I became the first licensed woman watchmaker in Holland. And so was established the pattern our lives were to follow over 20 years. When father had put the Bible back on its shelf after breakfast, he and I would go down the stairs to the shop while Betsy stirred the soup pot and plotted magic with three potatoes and a pound of mutton. With my eye on income and outlay, the shop was doing better and soon we were able to hire a sales lady to preside over the front room while father and I worked in back. There was a constant procession through this little back room. Sometimes it was a customer. Most often it was simply a visitor from a laborer with wooden clumping on his feet to a fleet owner, all bringing their problems to father. Quite unabashedly in the sight of customers in the front room and the employees working with us, he would bow his head and pray for the answer. He prayed over the work too. There weren't many repair problems he hadn't encountered, but occasionally one would come along that baffled even him. And then I would hear him say, Lord, you turn the wheels of the galaxies. You know what makes the planet spin and you know what makes this watch run. The specifics of the prayer were always different. For father, who loved science, was an avid reader of a dozen university journals. Through the years, he took his stopped watches to the one who set the atoms dancing or who keeps the great currents circling through the sea. The answers to these prayers seemed often to come in the middle of the night. Many mornings, I would climb under my stool to find the watch that we had left in a hundred despairing pieces fitted together and ticking merrily. One thing in the shop I never learned to do as well as Betsy, and that was to care about each person who stepped through the door. Often, when a customer entered, I would slip out the rear door and up to Betsy in the kitchen. Betsy, who is the woman with the Alpina lapel watch on a blue velvet band, stout, around 50? That's Mrs. Van Den Kukul. Her brother came back from Indonesia with malaria, and she's been nursing him. Corey, as I sped back down the stairs, ask her how Mrs. Rinker's baby is. And Mrs. Van Den Kukul, leaving the shop a few minutes later, would comment mistakenly to her husband, that Corey Ten Boom is just like her sister. Even before Tanta Anna's death in the late 1920s, 
The empty beds in the Bay A were beginning to fill up with the succession of foster children who for over 10 years kept the old walls ringing with laughter and Betsy busy letting down hems and pants cuffs. And meanwhile, Wilhelm and Nolly were having families. Wilhelm and Tyne, four children, Nolly and Flip, six. Wilhelm had long since left the parish ministry where his habit of speaking the hard truth had made a succession of congregations unhappy and had started his nursing home in Hilversum, 30 miles from Harlem. Nolly's family we saw more often as their school, of which Flip was now principal, was right in Harlem. It was a rare day when one or another of their six was not at the Baye to visit Opa at his workbench or peer into Tanta Betsy's mixing bowl or race up and down the winding steps with the foster children. Indeed, it was at the Baye that we first discovered young Peter's musical gift. It happened around our radio. We had first heard this modern wonder at a friend's house. A whole orchestra we kept repeating to each other. Somehow, that seemed especially difficult to produce inside a box. We began to put pennies aside toward a radio of our own. Long before the sum was raised, Father came down with the hepatitis that almost cost his life. During the long stay in the hospital, his beard turned snow white. The day he returned home, a week after his 70th birthday, a little committee paid us a visit. They represented shopkeepers, street sweepers, a factory owner, a canal bargeman, all people who had realized during father's illness what he meant to them. They had pooled their resources and bought him a radio. It was a large table model with an ornate shell-shaped speaker, and it brought us many years of joy. Every Sunday, Betsy would scour the papers, British, French, and German, as well as our own, since the radio brought in stations from all over Europe and planned the week's program of concerts and recitals. It was one Sunday afternoon when Nolly and her family were visiting that Peter suddenly spoke up in the middle of a Brahms concerto. It's funny they put a bad piano on the radio. Shh, said Nolly. But what do you mean, Peter? asked Father. One of the notes is wrong. The rest of us exchanged glances. What could an eight-year-old know? But Father led the boy to Tante Jan's upright. Which note, Peter? Peter struck the keys up the scale until he reached B above middle C. This one, he said. And then everyone in the room heard it too. The B on the concert grand was flat. I spent the rest of the afternoon sitting beside Peter on the piano bench, giving him simple musical quizzes, uncovering a phenomenal musical memory and perfect pitch. Peter became my music student until about six months. He had learned everything I knew and went on to more expert teachers. The radio brought another change to our lives one that father at first resisted. Every hour over the BBC, we could hear the striking hours of Big Ben. And with his stopwatch in his hand corrected to the astronomical clock in the shop, father conceded that the first stroke of the English clock, time after time, coincided with the hour. Father remained, however, mistrustful of this English time. He knew several Englishmen, and they were invariably late. As soon as he was strong enough to travel by train again, he resumed his weekly trips to Amsterdam to get naval observatory time. But as the months passed, and Big Ben and the observatory continued in perfect agreement, he went less regularly, and finally not at all. The astronomical clock, in any case, was so jarred and jiggled by the constant rattle of automobile traffic in the narrow street outside that it was no longer the precision instrument it had been. The ultimate ignomy came the day Father set the astronomical clock by the radio. In spite of this and other changes, life for the three of us, Father, Betsy, and me, stayed essentially the same. Our foster children grew up and went away to jobs or to marry. 
but they were often in the house for visits. The hundredth anniversary came and went. The following day, Father and I were back at our workbenches, as always. And I think we'll uh, call it a day here and continue reading this next time. Till then, as Tigger says, ta-ta for now. Thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.